You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Jared Mounts with Jake's Bait and Tackle. So how are you doing today? We're doing well. We're doing well. Excited to get back at this Mm -hmm. and, and get some more insight, learn some more. Absolutely. And we have a pretty cool guest today, don't we? Yeah, we've got uh, one of our little customers, Chris Arvin, with us today. And uh, Chris, what I like about Chris is uh, he's going to, he brings some experience in some different bodies of water that that we're used to here locally. So he's he's fished areas north and west, uh, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. So, um, you know, looking forward to hearing about some of these bodies of water that are still close enough to drive to and fish that a lot of people, some people have fished, but a lot of people may not even know about those mm-hmm. bodies of water. And I think that begs a question too. I know a lot of times people, there's people we talked earlier about how they get upset because we're sharing all this information out. But at the same time, if, if you got to look at it this way too, if we share out more information and people learn about other bodies of water that they may not have known about or fished before, that kind of spreads out to your fishermen too and your mm-hmm. anglers. And so you're hitting other bodies of water. Not everybody's focusing on Riverton and and maybe Lake Frederick. So, Chris, uh, come on in and, and tell us a little bit. Tell our viewers, uh, listeners about yourself. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I tournament fish. It's been one of my things here for the last couple of years now that uh, my life's starting to settle out a little bit. I just recently separated from the Marine Corps uh, last weekend, actually. So, oh, well, six, thanks for your service. Yeah, How you many so years much. were you in the Marines? Six years. Six years. Um, we appreciate that. Ready to get, you know, past get that, on. put it behind me and start uh, a new chapter in my life. Okay. So uh, this season, I'm focusing more time and effort into tournament fishing and stuff and really ramping up for that. It's, it's really got me excited, especially after the last two seasons where I kind of like couldn't focus all my effort to it. Mm-hmm. I couldn't hit it as hard as I wanted to. Now it's no holds bar and I'm ready to get out there and get after it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much uh, I'm a government contractor right now. Uh, thank goodness my schedule lines up to the point where I can have the weekends open. I can go out, I can fish the tournaments and stuff. It doesn't interfere. So we're uh, we're full steam ahead this season on that. That's good stuff. Maybe let's dive right into maybe Upper Potomac. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Talk to us a little bit about uh, where specifically are you fishing on the Upper Potomac and, and kind of what are you targeting and, uh-huh. and what works for you? Oh, uh, so most of my effort, because uh, I have an outboard prop boat, um, so I can't run the skinny water that the jets get to. Mm-hmm. Uh, between dam four and five is most of my effort, and that's where most of it's focused. Most of my tournaments up there are on that stretch of water, and it's just you know peace of mind, not mm-hmm. losing lower units, not mm-hmm. losing props. I can run that. I know the water well. Uh, mainly smallmouth. That's the predominant species up there. Your largemouth are few and far between, but they're still there uh 2019 we had a year in tournament first fish i caught that day was a 314 large mouth wow unheard of on that part yeah. of the river now fast forward to this past year somebody brought in a 511 and it was a longer of the tournament i had a buddy wow. that had him as a six pound small mouth holy he, moly yeah he, <laughs> he had like a 510 small mouth and thought he had the longer because that's freaking nuts you catch something like that up there you're like yeah i got this yeah and this guy comes in and pulls out this giant large mouth and we're like yeah where, where did that come from mm-hmm. did you have that when you got here <laughs> but <laughs> But it's it's coming back. It's mm-hmm. uh, this is the best season we've had up there in a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the biggest consecutive bags of fish I've seen. Now, uh, because if you have less than ten pounds, you're not catching a check anymore. Yeah, and it used to be the contrary. If you which had, is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because uh, we brought in our biggest bags of the year and came in like seventh place last year. So wow. we're like, yeah. Halfway through the day, we got this one in the bag. Get back to the boat ramp and. Mm-hmm. It definitely was not in the bag. But. What ramp are you all going out of? Yeah, uh, we put it in right there at uh, Dam Four, mm-hmm. above, right the, above dam, the dam, on Clear yeah. Spring Side. Mm-hmm. Um, if you Google it, it'll take you right to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for the viewers at home, um, that if you live under a rock, so the Upper Potomac really starts at, at the falls and it goes all the way up towards Harper's Ferry. That would be, I think, the main stem of the Upper Potomac, and then at the split where the Shenandoah and the Potomac River converge, uh, that's I guess the second part of the Upper Potomac where it goes all the way up into Dam Four, Dam Five, Shepherdstown, Williamsport, and and so on into West Virginia area. Just for you guys to get like a, a mental idea of this area. And what's crazy about this part of the river is it's near one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the world. Mm-hmm. Like I was looking on the map the other day, just on, on the mainstream of the Upper Potomac, and you have like Lansdowne, 
mm -hmm. and the heart yeah. of DC there. And to think that you have some amazing smallmouth fishing mm -hmm. and musky fishing, if you guys haven't mm -hmm. seen that part of the podcast, it right there. And it's just crazy that we have this and nobody fishes it. Very few people do, unless you know. Right. So now, can you have a Maryland or West Virginia license on that? Yeah, they second? have a reciprocity agreement. Yeah. Okay, so cool. if you're, I mean, 90% <clears> of the time when we're up there, you look mm -hmm. left and you see West Virginia, you look right, you see Maryland. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but it's i guess the lower time it does the same thing with virginia and mm -hmm. maryland and all yeah. that stuff so mm -hmm. it's it's the same thing mm -hmm. so what got you into like fishing that part of the river was it just like you you were born here and then you just you moved here like what what got you into fishing this area so i grew up in berkeley county out around okay. hedgesville area okay and uh when i was a kid i used to wait cherry run a lot and that's above dam five so as the crow flies you have dam five mccoy's ferry and then like the cherry run area mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, my stepdad actually had a lot down there with him and his family. And we'd go down and I'd just wade the river because it's pretty shallow. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I'd ever caught like a big small mouth. And I was like, all right, there's something to this. So that kind of got the ball rolling. And then uh, I still live local. I actually live in Berkeley County still to this day. So just the, the ease of access. Mm -hmm. I can be there in a little bit of no time and mm -hmm. get out and run the boat. And I don't have to go to a trolling motor only mm -hmm. lake. I can... Mm -hmm. Get a workout out of the boat mm -hmm. for the most part and mm -hmm. i'm starting to know it more now and i'm starting to catch bigger fish consistently mm -hmm. and it's just fun you know and it's kind of nice too because the, the idea what you're talking earlier about the a lot of you think of river a lot of these places on the river especially shandoa and other areas of the potomac you need to be running a jet which, yeah. so knowing you know having a prop boat and still being able to put a big boat or mm -hmm. you know prop boat on and still fish a river you know and catch smallmouth um that that's always good that's helpful to know yeah and, and then going from because i just moved to the area about a year ago and i'm still learning that part of the river it goes is it goes dam five then dam four which is i think also called like big slack water or vice versa it's vice versa so mm -hmm. it's dam four so you then have dam, dam four then williamsport okay. access and then above that you have the tailwaters of dam five okay and then there's a, also a put in up off of uh, four locks road that's where the slack water starts at dam five and then from there you have McCoy's Ferry, then Cherry Run, and then Hancock, and all those places and put in. So there's a uh, there's a lot of access, a lot of water, a lot of a lot water. Of water to fish. Uh, yeah. The one spot that I fish on Dan Four in my boat because it's it's an 18 foot aluminum boat with a 75 horsepower outboard. It takes me 13 minutes to get there. Hmm. It's a good run. Yeah. On that stretch of the river, you're hard pressed mm -hmm. to find a, a run like that without a jet. Mm -hmm. But if you do have a jet, I mean, you can run mm -hmm. miles and miles. Uh, there's How's the pressure in this? Are you getting you seeing a lot of other boaters, a lot of other anglers? It depends. Mm -hmm. uh, there's little to no pressure through the week. Mm -hmm. On the weekends, the pleasure boating pressure, I think, <sighs> is the main thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we were sitting out there last year, and wake boats come by. You know, mm -hmm. They suck in 8,500 oh gallons of water, and they're throwing a six-foot wake. And you're out there trying to throw something. Mm -hmm. and First time I with my wife on Dam 5, it was this past summertime, and there was this wake boater. And he was literally throwing, I think, almost a two foot wave. And mm -hmm. this is like a narrow part. Mm -hmm. And it was just insane because he'd go back and forth and you're like, you were done. You couldn't fish that area. So yeah. the pleasure boating there, it is in the summertime. It's, it's, it can it's be rough. stupid. <laughs> and just knowing that, I think, you know, it's always good. I mean, <clears throat> most diehard anglers, you know, this, there's never an off season to fishing. So you're not going to see them out there this time mm -hmm. of year. And, you know, you're only talking maybe two, three months out of the year. And then, like you said, mostly weekends. And so I'm sure if you're hitting an early morning, late evening, Staying out of the middle part of the day, um, or right now is probably a good time to fish it. You're not going to have as right much. Right for, there's no pressure on yeah. anybody water right now because it's so cold out. Yeah, do, you, do they <clears throat> get different types of pressure, and then how do they respond? So because you have Dam 4 and Dam 5, it's basically like two separate lakes, and you have one that basically runs up to the Williamsport little, like I don't know, like runoff dam, and then you have the one that basically you you have free reign forever. Do they fish differently? Do they fish the same? If, if one's bad, you're like, I'm just going to go to the other one today, or is it like if this one's bad, I know the other one's going to be just as bad? I think time of the year really dictates that. Okay. Um, I think Dam Four power fish is better. I think Dam Five finesse fish is better. Uh, it doesn't seem like Dam 4 gets the fishing pressure or the good fishing pressure, I should say, as Dam 5 does. Back 15 years ago, Dam 5 was known as like the winter hole. Like mm -hmm. if you weren't winter fishing at Dam 5, you weren't smallmouth fishing. Hmm. Uh, there was tournaments up there, early 2000s, that were taking pretty close to 20 pounds to win. Wow. And which is unheard of nowadays. Like that's mm -hmm. super impressive for the upper Potomac. But you're hair jig fishing, you're tube fishing, you're throwing a, a grub. Mm -hmm as slow as possible and six pound mm -hmm. test and that's how those big bags were getting caught hmm. to this day finesse fishing still reigns supreme at damn five for whatever reason damn four i'm throwing spinner baits 
this thing, the old good old DT6. That's where my jerk bait fishing comes in to play a good bit, mm -hmm. especially when I get in 10 foot of water or less. Um, and a lot of people think rivers, they think, all right, well, I have to run the skinny water and find a deep hole. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are overlooking the deep water up there, which has been pretty good for me here of late. Um, I've noticed a lot of people in the area, now even one of my best friends, when we thought of 20 foot of water, we're like, man, that's, that's deep. You know, we don't know how to fish that. Mm -hmm. So we got out of our comfort zone. And I'll tell you, Lake Frederick was probably, I don't mm -hmm. want to Help beat that. that dead yeah, horse, no, no, but that, that's what got me out of my mm -hmm. comfort zone. Sure. Because everything's 20 foot. The average depth of that lake right. is 21 foot. And mm -hmm. you could bump out in 30, 40, 50 <clears> foot of water. So now when we see 20 foot, we look at it. And the funniest thing was, he was like, look at our boats. They're both 18 foot. He's like, stand this thing straight up on end. He's like, it's not that deep. That's right. Uh, Good yeah. point. And I was like, all right, yeah, you have something to that point. Mm -hmm. Let's back off. Let's fish this deeper water. That's right. And last year, that's how I caught that almost six pounder up there. That We pushed out deeper and I was still trying to fish shallow for some reason. He's mm -hmm. like, they're straight ahead of the boat. I was like, all right. Because I was catching 14, 15 inches in that 12 mm -hmm. to 15 foot mm -hmm. of water. That's right throw out 22 foot as soon as it hits the bottom line jumps and i was like all right there's one i set the hook and it doesn't move and i was like oh my god all right here we go <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah it's so mental because uh, i remember when i started to learn how to fish deep and like in college we got to go to lake kiwi uh, our second national championship and we were drop shotting for spotted bass in like 30 to 40 feet of water and it was all like you said it's like it's mental it's like oh my god this is like the moon and it's like once you get over that you can start visualizing that this is basically no different than if it was three inches mm -hmm. of water like mm -hmm. on the Shenandoah River. Mm -hmm. You just got to mentally get over that. Um, so why do you think one like fish is different than the other when it comes to power? Is it like water clarity, vegetation, cover? Dam 5 does have a lot more eelgrass and it's got some kind of, I don't know what kind of grass it is. It almost looks like coontail, but I couldn't say for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and it grows pretty thick along the banks up there, which is nice because that seems, mm -hmm. Dam 5 seems to have a little bit higher population of largemouth because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dan Forest, predominantly eelgrass. The rock in the bottom structure is a little bit different up at Dan 5. I've noticed more chunk rock, mm -hmm. uh, bigger boulders, stuff like that. It almost kind of puts me in the mind of the Shenandoah in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan 4, one of my spots is mainly pea gravel, stuff the size of a softball or smaller. Mm -hmm. And they're chasing bait more up there, I've noticed. Hmm. Seems like Dan 5, it's it's more of a crawl pattern that that dictates like how good your day is going to go. Okay. At Dan 4, if they're eating crawfish, fine they're eating crawfish we'll throw tubes and stuff mm -hmm. but i've noticed a lot more shiners and a lot more bait at damn four and i think mainly because there's a lot more i wouldn't say a lot more docks it's just more water so there's mm -hmm. more docks so mm -hmm. the the shiners and stuff are pushing up under those mm -hmm. um Dam five eddies play more than Dam four does because Dam four is just a long channel, a lot of stretch of river. Mm -hmm. There's not many a lot eddies. of slack water a lot of slack water <clears throat> and Dam five is the same way but there's eddies when the water gets up on the bank so even this time like it's what 10 degrees outside right now mm -hmm. if the river was running five and a half six and a half feet those fish would almost be on the bank because the eddies are there and that's the right. only time they can get out of the the flow of the current, the current mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. and i think that's also why finesse fishing plays more up there mm -hmm. at dam four at five at, at five, five. Yeah. yeah so because you have that second dam like does one get dirtier faster than the other so if you had a heavy rain does that blow out both of them mm -hmm. or okay yeah because it's all just the same stretch it's, okay and it mainly like if we get rain here it's not a big deal if we get rain in hampshire county up towards moorfield romney mm -hmm. stuff like that mm -hmm. then you really start seeing the problems mm -hmm. the Coming water off the mountain yeah, yeah the mountains and then you have <clears throat> a little capon river comes in mm -hmm. back creek a pack in mm -hmm. uh the actually the tournament i caught that big largemouth last year when we were sitting at the boat ramp at dam four at big slack it was chocolate milk we run off the river past the packing clear again mm -hmm. that's, that's crazy thing. yeah mm -hmm. so the more tributaries up river they get blown out the worse it is for us down here so when we see rain in the forecast and it's coming from east to west we're like all right we're good we'll be able to go mm -hmm. out it'll be the same pattern but if it's coming across the mountains and we're getting rain in hampshire county and cumberland and all those places you might as well just write it off if it's three or four days after that rain okay because that's where you're going to see your cloudy water your nastiness that's, that's crazy i tell you, you know he brings up a good point you know you mentioned earlier and I, you can't this this tip or technique or or recommendation applies in any body of water and you talked about lake frederick mm -hmm. uh the idea of pushing off that bank and we've talked before but we can all relate to it's the a bank thing. it's a thing but it is <laughs> and mm -hmm. i think you know something like good thing about podcasts you can learn and that's one thing that 
you know, when you say that, you're so right. And, and that's what we're working on now, too, is trying to get off the bank and get in that deeper, yep. you know, 20 plus foot of water um, and learn how to fish that because the fish are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you just got to make yourself turn and throw in that deeper water. Um, and as you saw, now you have success. You've had success. Now you have confidence in that. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> you're just not that you can't go shallow. You know, Travis talked about that, too. You can still fish shallow because oh, you yeah. know that. That's mm -hmm. what you've grown up fishing. We all know that. We can see that and relate to it. But if you can force yourself to push out, I don't care on, if you're on a body on a river or a lake or push out into that deeper water and start exploring that, um, you know, it'll, you'll become a better angler and you'll catch more fish. That's a blessing and a curse in this area too, is because mm -hmm. we have so few bodies of water mm -hmm. and they're so small. So, mm -hmm. you know, Lake Frederick's 117 acres, mm -hmm. uh, Sleepy Creek Lake up in Berkeley County in the Hedgesville mm -hmm. area is 212 acres. They're so small and so pressured that you mm -hmm. have to fine tune your techniques yeah. to this. Mm -hmm. But it's also cool because the average depth of Frederick is 21 feet. Mm -hmm. The max depth at Sleepy Creek is 25. Mm. So, and they're completely different. Sleepy mm -hmm. Creek is full of pads. Everywhere you go on that lake is lily pads mm -hmm. and standing timber. Frederick, you just have standing timber now. Right. So the amount of takeaways you get from fishing all these little different mm -hmm. bodies of water in this area, because it can be drastically different. Mm -hmm. I can go to Big Pool, Maryland and in Western Maryland over towards uh, Clear Spring and Four Locks area. And I can fish wooden rock and mud bank all day long mm -hmm. because it's a big mud bowl. You'd be lucky to find 10 plus feet of water. Mm -hmm. But I can go over there and I can throw the meat and potato stuff, Carolina rigs, jigs, crankbaits, spinnerbaits, chatterbaits, power fish, get that fine tuned in. Mm -hmm. Then I can run to Frederick where in the summertime, the water clarity is th you know, 30 plus feet. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I can throw, you know, I can fine tune my finesse techniques. Right. Large mouth fishing in both of those. Then I can pick up and move to Sleepy Creek mm -hmm. where I'm punching pads all day. I'm throwing frogs. Mm -hmm. I'm fishing predominant, you know, vegetation all day long and then pick up and go to the river and I can smallmouth fish and mm -hmm. we can fine tune all those things in this one little area, mm -hmm. which makes it cool because it seems like every body of water here is so drastically different. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes you better because even like this year was the first year I'd fished the lower Potomac since 2013. Okay. Uh, before that, I had never fished it. I joined mm -hmm. a club in high school, and we had two or three tournaments down there. Mm. And then I was asking one of the guys, I was like, what, how's the fish? They're like, well, you got pads, you got grass. I was like, all right. Never fished that before in my life. I was mm -hmm. like 16, 17 years old. But I had a farm pond that had grass, just full. Mm -hmm. I was like, all yeah, right, man. I'm going to go down here and see if I can catch mm -hmm. fish out of it, just to try just to teach something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the things I learned at that farm pond, I took with me to the lower Potomac, and it worked. The first mm -hmm. tournament I ever yep. fished down there, I had the lunker which mm -hmm. turned out to be the longer of the year. Mm -hmm. And I came in like third place mm -hmm. as a 16 year old kid that just taught myself how to fish grass like the week before. That's right. But I really feel like, <clears throat> and this might be a hot take. We, we really do act like California anglers here. If you, you, you talk to guys that are on the big circuit, they're from California. They talk about their versatility. They have so many different fisheries out there. And we in a microcosm have that. And we know how to fish pressure really well. Um, I remember uh, two weeks ago, I shot a, a special at uh, Jim Burnett park. And people were flabbergasted mm -hmm. that, how did you know how to catch them? He was like, well, I know how to fish finesse. Mm -hmm. I know how to fish pressure. It doesn't scare me because like <clears throat> growing up here, I had three ponds to fish mm -hmm. and I didn't have anywhere else to go. So you just mm -hmm. figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting skill because kids that grow up down south, they're so spoiled where they're like, you know, if we're not catching 30 pounds and mm -hmm. I don't have this whole area to myself, I don't know what to do. I spin out here. It's just mm -hmm. like, it's normal to deal with those conditions. Mm -hmm. And so we can make stuff happen wherever we go. Mm -hmm. I think trying something different too, is what surprised me about that segment you did is, and again, I've always said you, you go, if you're bank fishing, you're going to throw out as far as you mm -hmm. can. If you're on a boat, you're going to be thrown to the bank. But mm -hmm. what you did there too, is that you're throwing along the bank, which was interesting. I wouldn't have thought to do that, but mm -hmm. it worked. And, You've learned from fishing that 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 works, and so sometimes you got to go against what you you tend yeah. to do and try something different. But another common theme that he talked about is is and everybody's talked about is applying those whether you're a trout fisherman, your yeah. river pond, mm -hmm. you know, taking what you, you can learn something from every fishing experience out there, time on the water, and then you can turn and turn apply that on a body of water wherever in this region across the country, and you can have success. It's funny too. Mm -hmm. Your dad actually taught me something <clears throat> when you were over at the old shop still. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! So it's been that a long time about, ago. It goes back six, seven years ago. He's like, you got two guys, and you got a creek. One standing on this bank, one standing on this bank. Mm -hmm. He's like, what are they doing? And I was like, well, if you're on this bank, you're throwing at that one. Yep. He's like, if you're on that bank, you're throwing <laughs> yeah, at that that's one. That's right. He's like, so why not just throw down the bank? <clears throat> that's right. And that stuck with me. That that works. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> to add to that, because I was just thinking about that 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 pond episode. 
when you're dealing with pressure on this area, so you're fishing a tournament and you do have limited space, you're going to be fishing behind people at some point in the day. How do you approach the pressure on on a river like this when you have a tournament involved, when you have multiple boats? Like what what is your process of like, do you give an area a, a respite or do you just change your your strategy? The biggest thing I've seen here in this area that helps me is I'm a power fisherman. I'll take mm -hmm. this crankbait, this jerkbait, chatterbait, swim jig, spinnerbait mm -hmm. over anything in my tackle box. If I could throw these all day long, that's what I want to throw. Mm -hmm. I've noticed, especially with the older crowd, which seems to, you know, our rivers and stuff around here draw an older crowd because they've been fishing it their whole life. Mm -hmm. They love throwing net rigs. They love throwing tubes, slow moving baits. I haven't really seen a lot of people power fishing. So really? if I'm, and it's weird, and you would think that like yeah. everybody, you know, you grow up throwing a crankbait, you grow up throwing yeah. a spinnerbait. I'd say finesse fishing in general, and I don't really consider tube fishing finesse fishing because, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes if I'm throwing a heavier tube, I'll bump up, but it's still finesse fishing. People are overlooking all these baits anymore, or they're just scared to throw it, or they don't throw them correctly. Because if I'm coming in behind people that are dragging tubes, that are throwing Senkos, that are doing this and that, and they're, they're fishing slow, and I pick up this, especially this or this, I catch fish and they don't. That is insanely, that's a fantastic observation. Because I'd never, if I was in a tournament on Lake Anna, my first thing would be downsized finesse. I'm fishing behind someone. Mm -hmm. You're flipping the script completely. 100%. Be because it's almost like this small mouth Ned Rig light line. Mm -hmm. And you're completely changing the, the game on them. That's fantastic. I would rather come behind somebody finesse fishing with a power pre uh, presentation than try to do what they're doing differently. Mm -hmm. um, I look at smallmouth bass like I look at cats. That's a good. It's point. a weird yeah. analogy, That's but right. they're angry. They're yeah. mad at yeah. the world. <laughs> you get your laser pointer out and you run that thing across the floor. Mm -hmm. No matter what, the cat's going to chase it. But if you let that laser pointer set on the floor, the cat's just going to stand there and stare at it. So when people were throwing a tube and they're letting it soak and they're, you know, <clears throat> just fishing slow, the fish has got more of an opportunity to look at it, more of an opportunity to, to analyze it, size mm -hmm. it up. Um, but if you come behind them with a jerk bait and you throw it like a maniac and just as fast as you can burn it across them fish, they mm -hmm. don't have ch a chance mm -hmm. to analyze the thing. Mm -hmm. Like this, this jerk bait here, it's, it's a jackal re-range I actually bought from here. It looks like everything and it looks like nothing. Mm -hmm. This could be a shad, it could be a shiner, it could be whatever you want it to be. It's just a general bait fish pattern, mm -hmm. but it's coming past their face so erratically and so quick, they don't have a chance. And it's just like taking that laser pointer and just running across the floor as fast as you can. That cat's gonna chase it. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you got its attention and it's chasing it and you stop that dot, it'll, you know, put its paw on it. If I rip this in front of a small mouse face about as fast as I can rip it and then just all of a sudden stop it, it doesn't have a chance to think. It's like, oh crap, I got to grab a hold Especially of it. it's chasing it, yeah. Yep. So talk about that. How are you, how are you working that? So. that might, sounds a little bit different than what most people. Yeah, everybody thinks of a jerk bait. They think, faster. you know, jerk, pause for 35 seconds yeah. and leave it set. I'll take a jerk bait <clears throat> and almost work it like a top water, like a, a Zara Spook or something. Hmm. I love the re-ranges because of the weight transfer system. And I can throw them as far as I want to throw them. Especially uh, my setup for them is a uh, Dobbins Fury 703 CB. Uh, 10 pound cigar in Vizx and a Shimano uh, SLX MGL. That MGL reel has just completely flip flop my jerk bait fishing because no matter how hard you want to throw that thing, you get minimal backlashes mm -hmm. and it just slings it a mile. So I'll make as long of a cast as possible. I'll jerk it down as quick as I can to the you know desired okay. depth. Mm -hmm. That thing runs four to six feet. I'm throwing it on 10 pound test. I might get seven out of it depending, but. I don't let it set if the water temperature is over 60 degrees okay. for more than like a second. Mm -hmm. Like tactical bass, and actually we talked about them earlier, they have a really good point with the crankbait fishing when they're burn, 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 pause. Yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. It's the same cadence with the jerkbait. <clears throat> twitch, 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 pause, twitch, twitch, and just keep it moving. Mm. And then as soon as it sets for like a second, because you, know, you make that real long cast, they might follow it 15, 20 yards. Yeah. But mm -hmm. as soon as you pause it that it, first time, it's, yeah, it it's like, oh man, I gotta grab a hold of that. Mm -hmm. If not, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and that's the biggest thing I've seen. Yeah, granted, when the water gets cold, below fifty. So 40, what are you doing then? Once that water temperature drops below, what do you? I still like going fast. <laughs> like, <laughs> so now you're doing like a three second ball, like Ricky like Bobby. Hundred degrees, I fast, gotta go fast. Six degrees fast, fast uh -huh. forty fast, <clears throat> and it seems to work for you though. It does. Um, I might have to pause it for three to five seconds mm -hmm. or so. Are you going with a deeper, deeper diving one in the winter? 
you know, uh, well, so this guess depends on who goes back to your water. You're fishing yeah. if you're only, yeah, if you're in six foot of water, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I tend to fish the middle of the water column with a jerk bait. Okay. Or if I see fish suspended, I like to fish above them. Mm -hmm. I was actually, I was watching uh, Mark Zona. He was talking about mm -hmm. it the other day. Uh, fish like the feet up. They don't like mm -hmm. the feet down, right. especially for bait. Yeah, that's big. If like, mm -hmm. it's not like they're goby eaters. Mm -hmm. or, or they're pure crayfish. Crawfish eaters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they'll feed down. Yeah. But if I'm, you know, throwing a bait mm -hmm. fish profile, I mm -hmm. want to fish above them. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the eyes are on top of the head. They're looking up. They're looking mm -hmm. 100 or 270 degrees left and right, I think, is their field of view. Mm -hmm. So when I'm throwing that, if they're if I'm fishing ten foot of water, I want it to run four or five feet. I'll bump up to twelve pound test. Um, if I'm fishing twenty foot of water, I'll throw like the plus ones and get it down. But I, I like to use my side scan on my boat to just see where the, some of the fish are if they're suspended or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I like to fish above them. Mm -hmm. uh, it just something about it triggers a response that yeah. they see it coming across the top of their head. They'll feed up to eat bait, but they won't mm -hmm. feed down to eat it. And I think I had a problem with that last year. I wanted to fish deeper. I wanted to get it down. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hit the rock with the jerk bait. I got I got big bites on it, mm -hmm. but I got less bites on it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I wasn't fishing above the fish for them to come up to react to it. Interesting. And that, that's so interesting because it's a cultural thing. Because I remember when I was younger and I would flip through magazines and McClellan would talk about um Mike McClellan talking about winter jerk bait fishing, and he'd like mm -hmm. leave it paused for like almost like three minutes. Mm -hmm. And Kevin would all Kevin would never give him shit for it because like I can't I can't do that. I physically can't do that. Right. And so you culturally, you think in the winter time this is what you do. And you alluded to it, and maybe I'll try to link that video what Tactical did with with the Tactical crank in the winter time. And they're literally burning crankbaits in like freezing water and 36 catching degrees. massive ones. Mm -hmm. And it's like that you're doing that with a jerkbait in the wintertime. You're making them react to this thing. And it's a brilliant strategy because culturally people don't do it. They think mm -hmm. cold water, slow down. Yeah, and that, do, and that does. You're right. You got to go. You always hear uh, let the fish tell you how they want it too. Yes. And so you have to you have to vary that cadence, that retrieval, that you know pace that you're bringing in mm -hmm. to see and don't get. Because I've done the same thing in the winter. Like been so slow it's like killing you um but yet if i found if i sped it up a little bit that's the fish are now reacting to it so you, but you have to experiment with that mm -hmm. so those rules of thumb what you're saying rules too, of thumb yes is are great but they don't work for everybody don't apply mm -hmm. for everybody and so you got to do what works best for you that's just like you said winter time too our minds tell us jerk bait in winter time but that thing will work year round i'm i'm, I'm guessing the it's way, a like 12 you say, month out of the year bait there ain't nowhere well, i go that yeah. thing ain't tied <clears> on i love it and it's all right. I'm really going to blow your mind here with another stigma. I like taking, you know, baits out of the package and mm -hmm. everybody's got this general idea of what they're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. This thing, you know, just regular old jackhammer. When people fish grass with these, I noticed that, like, you know, they, they catch that clump and they like mm -hmm. to really just rip mm -hmm. it out of there, mm -hmm. just reel through it. Mm -hmm. And it's almost the exact opposite of what I do with the jerk bait because they're thinking they're going to. I've seen it a lot as a lower Potomac too. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, no matter if it's a swim jig, a chatter bait, or a spinner bait, or what, I don't rip it out of the grass mm -hmm. to get that reaction bite. For whatever reason, I found, especially down there, that if you just reel through it, mm -hmm. it'll eventually free itself, right. and then you get the bite. Right. But I think it comes down to a lot to pressure too. Mm -hmm. Everybody's ripping it out of there. Nobody's yeah. just kind of reeling through the grass. And everyone's throwing a chatterbait now. Everybody. Well, you think actually out. too, the fish aren't, I mean, the fish are able to work through that. So they're not yeah. a natural presentation. They're mm -hmm. not going to shoot out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just to your point. That's a good point. And it is. There's a lot of times in a lot of times you get fooled by that grass. And yet it's when it comes out of that, that fish is they're waiting there. It's an ambush. Mm -hmm. It just popped out. It ambushed it. Well, you, you're thinking, your mind's thinking, you're still behind on, well, I got grass, yeah. but well, you just got a hit there too, so you better set the hook. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys talk, it's funny, talk, and it's, this happens. You think, well, I'm in the grass. Well, next thing you know, you got a fish in the grass. Why? Because it, it ate it as soon as it came out of it. Mm -hmm. So, so chatterbaiting smallmouth. Oh, that that actually, first time last year I tried it. It blows yeah. my mind mm -hmm. that some people have talked about it. Does it actually, is that a thing? Does it work? Mm -hmm. That's a yes. It does. Okay. It does. <laughs> as much as I don't want to give that yeah. secret away, it does. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even fighter last year, what was it? The Northern Swing. Ah, uh, Sham. Was it Champlain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or one of them. He was catching them on the jackhammers, mm -hmm. like a three quarter to an ounce, fishing deep. Yeah, we've caught them on the uh, Susquehanna River, Bach, turned me on to that. And mm -hmm. uh, it's it's phenomenal. Actually, my best friend's dad won a tournament up there mm -hmm. on a white chatterbait uh, yeah. jackhammer last year on the Susky. And the great thing about the jackhammer is it's, it's a cross between that jig and not really a spinner bait, it's bladed bait, but the idea that you can vary that retrieval too. You, mm -hmm. I mean, some guys fish it like a jig yeah, and we'll let it sit and then, you stroke know, it. just stroke it and then it gets that, but that vibration is 
is phenomenal. I mean, you can work it in any level of the water column. I throw it on a six to three retrieve. Mm -hmm. I like the slower reels for them. It's almost kind of like, for me, I treat this like the old guys did with a spinnerbait. Mm -hmm. The six to three to six to eight gear ratios and kind of keeping it bottom contact and stuff. Uh, I know Brett Height is a big proponent of, you know, fishing deep yeah. rock and stuff with them. I applied what I learned from him off of his videos and stuff mm -hmm. to fishing grass with it. If mm -hmm. I can keep it, like, especially early in the year towards the bottom of that spatter dock mm -hmm. and the pad stems and stuff down there, I've noticed that it doesn't matter if it's rock or if it's pad stems or what, you know, they're still sitting at the bottom mm -hmm. because they're cold. It's the same, same style of fishing. Are but, you putting a paddle tail or a crawl trailer on it or it just depends? 90% of the time I'm throwing a zoom Z crawl on the back of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed, I guess it's a more compact profile. Uh, so I don't get as many short strikes. It's the same way with my spinnerbait trailers. I went back to the old school, just split tails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it still has an excellent, you know, a lot of movement and stuff out of it, but it's just a more subtle movement. I don't get as many short strikes. I don't, I haven't put a trailer hook on a spinnerbait in years. Just Here's your question for you too. Here's where I struggled. I was diehard spinner. I throw a spinner all the time, and then Jackhammer came out, and that seemed like I got away from the spinner bait. So when do you when do you distinguish between a chatter bait and a spinner bait as far as what you're, when you're going to throw it? For the same thing with the jerk bait, I keep both of these tied on if I'm largemouth fishing all the time. If I'm fishing more grass or pads, mm -hmm. I'll tend to you know gravitate towards the jackhammer mm -hmm. just because it comes through it a little better. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure you guys know they don't come through wood very good. Mm -hmm. So if I'm fishing any kind of hardcover, docks, wood, whatever, I'll gotcha. pick the spinnerbait up. Gotcha. But if I'm noticing, like, you know, you hear a lot of dock talk and stuff, and, oh, yeah, I cracked him on a chatterbait yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, and I'll start looking around. And you can kind of, like, you can get a good grasp of what everybody's going to throw just by walking past their boats. Right. So I'll just kind of peek in. I'm like, all right, well, he's got chatterbaits tied on, especially at the Potomac. <clears> like, you see a lot of people throwing a chatterbait nowadays. Mm. And it's like you said, everybody yeah. forgets about this. Yeah. This has been a staple since, you know, Roland Martin started throwing this thing in like the seventies. Yeah. It's a forgotten bait. It seems like anymore. So if I'm seeing a lot of chatterbaits tied on, I'll pick the spinner bait up and I'll throw it. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, you're, it's, it's the same general idea. Principle. Yeah. It's just a little more subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tend to opt for smaller blades a lot. Like this is like a, it's like a hybrid Indiana blade. And what Booyah does on this one is it kind of, instead of stamping the hole right down the middle of the blade, it's kind of offset. Mm. So it's got kind of a funky wobble to mm. it. Um, and I really like this spinnerbait, especially for smallmouth fishing, just because it's it's so subtle. Mm -hmm. Like It's low still profile. power fishing. Mm -hmm. It's low profile. Yeah. There's less noise. Mm -hmm. And I, I did, think that yeah. plays more than anything. Spinnerbait smallmouth. I did that on Champlain got a while ago. That is so much freaking fun when they freight train a spinnerbait. And it, oh, it, yeah. it very rarely does a spinnerbait last all day when mm -hmm. you're on a good smallmouth spinnerbait mm -hmm. fight. It is just, yeah. it's fun. <laughs> There's nothing like it. Oh, it's it's addicting. They got me on the Shenandoah last year. Oh, really? I was above uh, Millville Dam, mm -hmm. and it was right before dark. And I was catching them on the on this Fire Tiger DT6 actually, but it seemed like the lower the light got, the more they were eating spinnerbait, and they were freight training that thing, oh, like to the point where you think you're hung up, and then it just starts peeling drag. And mm -hmm. you're like, All right, that's a good one. That is a good <laughs> bite. They're so addicting to catch; they really are. I mean, it's a blessing we have those here. Back to that jerk bait too. You know, you, the way you're working, it, you know, made me think of uh, back in the day too, the old uh, repeller, rappeller, however you want to say it, but the floating minnow, the original floating minnow. Mm -hmm. You know, and that idea that in the summertime you're it's mainly top water, but you're jerking it and bringing it just subsurface. And again, it, they're just eating it. Yeah. And, you know, so I like, I like that, that concept of not getting in that we're habitual. Yeah. And I've been that way where I'm just a jerk, jerk, pause, like you say, and that's all I'm doing. I'm not mm -hmm. doing any faster with that. And I need to really switch that up a little bit and try something a little different. For you mentioned the grass <clears> and I know that it, we were talking a little bit about the uh, tidal Potomac there for a second, but going back to the upper before uh, we started shooting, you're talking about largemouth and the grass on the upper Potomac, which is pretty crazy. Could could you expand on that more? Like, is that a thing where you can actually catch them out of the grass like you would? You're not going to catch big ones, but, but they're can. there. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And it's totally different than you're not punching grass. You're, you're fishing over top of it, basically, because whatever grass it is up there seems to like grow like super like close to the bottom, but it's thick and you just see them kind of cruising over the top of it. Mm -hmm. So that's more of a, uh, I know a buddy of mine catches some wacky worm up there all the time, just mm -hmm. throwing it across the tops of the grass. Uh, the eelgrass, though, I have seen fish like get up underneath of it, and I've still yet to figure out how to present them a bait. Um, but I've seen smallmouth like tuck up under eelgrass, not even in mm -hmm. the pockets of it. Interesting. You just kind of cruise by and you see a tail kind of like at the backside of it where it's laid over. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're waiting to ambush shiners and stuff because the majority of the shiners that I see on that part of the river 
or gravitating towards the grass and the docks and stuff. And I'm sure that pattern's there. I just haven't given it the time of day. Okay. Um, I haven't taught myself really how to like approach that. I'll fish the grass edges a lot yeah, and I'll catch yeah. them, but I haven't really like focused all my effort and energy on like, Hey, I should fish eelgrass all day today. Mm -hmm. And cause everything else is so productive. Yeah. Cause I was like the a couple of times I was up there last summer and I was looking around, it's like, there's a nice distinct grass edge and I didn't give it much time, but my brain saying like, it's the, it's the title it's upper Potomac. Why would you fish grass? You think fish it like a smallmouth river, but there was so much of it. It's mm -hmm. like, this is probably why there's largemouth now in there is because mm -hmm. you have this available. Now there's also like four docks relatively compared to like Lake Anna there. Mm -hmm. um, do you ignore those on a tournament? Or if you're a kid going out there, should you even hit those docks or do they just get destroyed 24 seven? Yeah, I don't really see many people fishing the docks. Really? Honestly, no. Okay. Uh, you can catch fish off of them and you can catch, mm -hmm. you know, limited 12 inches, but I just haven't seen the size come off the mm -hmm. docks gotcha. compared to everything else. You can probably go up there and throw a three, four inch Senko around a docks all day long and catch fish. Mm -hmm. Just haven't seen the size when it comes to tournament fishing that I would mm -hmm. need to win or be competitive. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's still good. You can still catch fish off of it. It just doesn't play, I guess, when it comes to tournament fishing mm -hmm. and stuff compared to like deeper rock or honestly, the wood sometimes plays, but mm -hmm. it's not even a big factor, really. Mm -hmm. um, so before we switch, I guess, to. The other segment, mm -hmm. um, what would what kind of advice would you give kids that are going out uh, this spring to catch fish on the Upper Potomac? What to look for? What what to do? Just just some generic stuff that they could have success. All right, uh, like springtime, you're talking like 50, yeah. 60 degree water temperature stuff like that. Yeah, uh, jerk bait, uh, six to ten foot diving crankbait, whatever your favorite is, crawl patterns. I've noticed that the crawl patterns are way more productive than any other crankbait I throw or something super loud. Like I don't throw a crankbait that's a shiner pattern up there for whatever reason. I just don't catch as so many fish on it. But if I go fire tiger or if I go like a brown crawl pattern, I'll catch them. Um, so crankbait, jerkbait, spinnerbait. And then obviously you have to have a net and a tube just mm -hmm. in case because mm -hmm. sometimes it just, you know, that's how the day comes to be. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have to have that right. net rig um, and just target the 10 to 15 foot of water. I fish predominantly rock on that part of the river, no matter what the dam four, dam five, shepherd sound, whatever it is, I just tend to gravitate towards the rock. So mm -hmm. if I can find a good, I wouldn't even say a good population because you never seem to catch two out of the same spot. Mm -hmm. But if I catch fish, there's that whole like couple hundred yard stretch to where there is fish. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just stick to that, the crankbait fishing, tube fishing, jerkbait fishing, spare baits. Mm -hmm. If I can't get them fired up on a, on a power fishing technique, mm -hmm. I'll switch, I'll throw a tube, I'll throw a net rig. Mm -hmm. And I just go about it like that. It's 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 simple. I think yeah. a lot of people tend to overthink things. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you just go back to the basics. And right. What your strengths? You're fishing your strengths and then coming back. I did have two things too before we uh, head off. Uh, let's work down below. Let's say from Shepherdstown up to Dan Four. Like, what's your experience on that stretch of water, and how does that differ from what we've just talked about? And how are you fishing that? Are you putting in at Shepherdstown and going up, or you can. <clears throat> uh, it's a little bit harder of a run. Mm -hmm. It's impossible unless you have a jet. Mm -hmm. And okay. it's still kind of scary if you have yeah. a jet, depending on the flow of the water. <laughs> right. Uh, rock bruce are really nice. I didn't right. know that. <laughs> yeah, I know you couldn't. I mean, Shepherdstown, you could fish right around Shepherdstown and you get up to a certain rapid. You wouldn't make it up to Dam 4, obviously. But you could fish the Shepherdstown area. Mm -hmm. with it's, the it's deep water right there around the boat ramp. Mm -hmm. If you just went out and dropped a trolling motor, you could fish that. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to always put in there and run up towards Taylor's and Snyder's yep. Landing. Yep. Uh, but it kind of comes down to like your Susquehanna style river fishing. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a little more shallow up towards there. Mm -hmm. You're fishing a lot of eddies. If you find deep water, there's usually fish. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the gist of that is mm -hmm. if, if you're below the dams, it's, it's a tailwater fishery. Right. It's a traditional river style of fishing. Interesting. Right. So to find the islands, eddies, whatever mm -hmm. that's going to, you know, cause a break in the current, mm -hmm. just something different. Right. I would say too that I mean I went I went to Shepherd, um, and so one of the places we would go would be Dam Four, and we would just wait it, mm -hmm. right? So I've done a just, lot of waiting you know, up there. Go in on the Maryland side and, and just literally, and in the fall we usually were going out and catching Helgramites, you know, underneath the rocks, and we mm -hmm. would fish until I mean the moon was out. And we're still catching smallmouth, um, so that's an option too. Obviously, be careful around those dams too. Yeah, but, okay, definitely. Um, but if you get far enough down from it, you're not close to the dam too. It's weightable water. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can walk out and, and catch fish you know, in those sections as well, even if you don't have a boat. Yeah. So that's just something that, to keep in that's mind That's a good as point. Well. Yeah, waiting is definitely, a, <clears throat> I'd say the majority of my fishing below the dams mm -hmm. are, are waiting. Mm -hmm. And especially, too, summertime. Summertime with that current, 
moving water, oxygenated water. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, don't find yourself, well, I don't have a boat. I don't have a jet boat or, you know, I can't really, that's, that's falsehood too. You know, you can still walk out there. Yeah. Um, like I say, be careful with the currents and stuff, but you can still, you know, go out and catch fish. Oh, yeah. Speaking of safety. So I think it's four locks. Everyone at home, beware that you have to go under a train trestle and a tunnel. I think it's four locks. It is. It is scary as shit. If you did not know that's mm -hmm. what you're supposed to do. If you have power poles and I have 10 footers and I was mm -hmm. puckered that because I have a dually truck too. Mm -hmm. I had no idea if I was going to make it or not. So just for warning there, like that's, it's a little hairy mm -hmm. trying to get in and out of there. You can get a full size truck in a 21 foot boat oh, through you, you it, can, but it's tight. But, <laughs> it's I was real nervous. tight. Yeah. And it floods a little bit too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it, if you, if you didn't know that was there, you would think like, I can't make it. You can make it, mm -hmm. but it is a little. Especially uh, under that train bridge. It, yeah. There's always like, it seems like every time I go there, there's like a foot or two of water there. Which it's a fantastic ramp, but it's just that one section. It's like I really wish that was different on that on that sucker there. But anyway, just, and, just yeah, and the dams too. Or we're talking big dams. So I mean, I know yeah. there was an older couple. They were older. Mm -hmm. They went over the dam four and, and died. I think. Uh, I think it was five two, last year. There was somebody at dam five, five? last year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just something to. You know, as you get down in that slack water, yeah, you get close. Just Once you careful. start seeing Make marker sure buoys, <clears throat> yeah. Make sure your boats. Uh, yeah. Don't. You know, don't go with the dead motors. batteries. <laughs> yeah, don't get too yeah. crazy because it's, um, yeah, safety is important. And then last thing I just want to touch on too, moving off of that, uh, staying in West Virginia, you, you mentioned Sleepy Creek. Mm -hmm. um, again, that was, I fished it a long, long, long time ago. Very little. Haven't been back up there since. But uh, another little, you know, big lake that, you know, I don't think a lot of people know about. Uh, the road, I remember being really oh, bad awful. back to it, but then that kept a lot of people away. That's the big one. Uh, yeah. But maybe just, you know, talk to us a little bit, finish up talking to our listeners about Sleepy Creek and how they can have success on that that okay. body of water in mm -hmm. West Virginia. And so forewarning, you know, I lived like 15 minutes from the entrance. Mm -hmm. It would take me 15 minutes to get to the dirt road. It would take me an hour to get to the lake. <laughs> yeah, it's a rough it road. Gnarly. It's And they've kind of improved it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I know the last time I was up there, they were dumping truckloads of like rocks and stuff, trying to mm -hmm. fix the road, but it's mm -hmm. still rough. Mm -hmm. So that's my Which biggest sometimes is good though because yeah. like you say mm -hmm. it people early in the year go mm -hmm. people don't go because of that so mm -hmm. you you know you don't get as much pressure now the state record in west virginia came out of that lake at okay. one point and i'm pretty sure it was over 10 so wow. and they're pure northern strain bass okay and that lake fishes a lot like lakes up farther north mm -hmm. it's uh like tannic colored it's mm -hmm. yeah it's super dark water mm -hmm. but it's clear water like mm -hmm. you look at the bottom and you're like, hey, there's no visibility yet. Mm -hmm. It's still six to eight foot of visibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the vegetation filtering out all the sediment and stuff. It's so perfect and clean. It is. Yep. It's mm -hmm. a pristine lake. Oh my hmm. goodness. It's fantastic. But it's a rough on the fish sometimes. A lot of standing timber. A lot of standing mm -hmm. timber. Uh, you it, find a fish around that? Sometimes. It all depends. Uh, <clears throat> I'd say a lot more crappy fishing and stuff around the standing timber. Mm -hmm. I fish a lot of the weed edges. Okay. Uh, that seems to be my best producer of bass mm -hmm. uh you're going to get your boat hung up on the timber mm -hmm. i almost guarantee at least two or three times a trip because mm -hmm. as dark as that water is it's hard to see even with polarized glasses mm -hmm. and i always seem to hung, get hung mm -hmm. up on a stump but i've caught fish off the timber uh especially in the early in the year before the pads come up mm -hmm. i'll flip jigs mainly the 15 to 20 to foot of water down through there and that seems to hold more fish for whatever reason i think uh the original meadow branch channel if you're looking down the lake towards the dam, follows the left-hand side of the lake. Mm -hmm. And that creek channel has always held fish. Now at a certain point, there's like a secondary creek channel that comes when, when the lake widens and there's a ditch that runs down through there that holds fish too. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people overlook the deeper water down towards the dam okay. because you know, like anybody else, you see a mile of lily pads. Yeah. You mm -hmm. just gotta get in the heart of it. You gotta go fishing. Mm -hmm. But if you just spend some time trolling around with the trolling motor and finding some deeper structure, mm -hmm. Those fish don't get targeted. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time anymore, I go up there, I'll put in at the dam mm -hmm. and I'll spend all day in that deeper water. If I want to go punch, you know, if I'm coming up on a lower Potomac tournament and I don't have time to make a day of getting to the lower Potomac, mm -hmm. I go up there and flip around a little bit. Mm -hmm. and it's just nice batting practice, basically. Yeah, I, that's a good idea. It's really, to tie in everything we've been talking about when, when we said like this area can grow good anglers. I went there one time with a crappie rod and I said like, this is Florida. This looks just like Florida and how awesome it is that we can do Lake Frederick, where if you get two bites, you're a God to the, the, the upper Potomac where you can practice smallmouth to a place that I, if you haven't been there, guys, if you've been to the Harris chain, you know what I'm talking about? It looks like that. The water is mm -hmm. the same clarity and everything. And you can practice those techniques mm -hmm. right there. And it's right near DC. Mm -hmm. It's so crazy that we have all these just mm -hmm. unique fisheries. Mm -hmm. 
with potential for big bass, yeah. like you mm -hmm. said. And uh, most of the big bass I see up here come from ice fishing, believe it or not. Hmm. A lot really? of yeah, live shiners and huh. ice fishing. Well, like you just said, Florida. Yeah. What do you think of Florida? Shiners. Golden shiner Shiners, fishing, yeah. floating them out there around the pads. Interesting. Uh, we had an older buddy. It was actually a friend of my granddad's. They worked on the railroad together. Uh, he would go up, take a little John boat, four rods. Two had 80 pound braid, two had 65 pound braid, and he would spend all day just flipping pads all day wow. long. He might get two, three bites, yeah. but he's getting bigger bites Never than everybody else's. Yeah. And there's a there's good fish in there. It's like Frederick. You lock into a big one every mm -hmm. now and then. You mm -hmm. just have to weed through the little ones to get to the big mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, I mean, Senko fishing, you go, I'm just catch fish all day long on the mm -hmm. weed edges. Mm -hmm. Most of them are 12 to 15 inches, but mm -hmm. you're going to catch fish. It's a, it's a patience thing. You just got to wade through them. Yeah. That's cool. So somebody that's listening that maybe wants to fish that Upper Potomac or the uh, Sleepy Creek, uh, how can they get a hold of you? Where can they reach out to you if they have I, questions or you know recommendations? I have an Instagram page. <clears throat> uh, it's at West Virginia Bass Tactics okay. or WV Bass Tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just DM me on there. I have a Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. Chris Arvin. If you want to send me a direct message on there, mm -hmm. but uh, my my fishing page is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, it's at WV underscore Bass Tactics. And just send me a message, and I'll be more than happy to talk to That's you about awesome. it. That's awesome. And then link to this and all the places we talked about will be in the episode description, along with this gentleman's social media stuff. So this was part one of our interview. We're going to be coming back with part two. Just stay tuned, guys. We'll see you later. My name is Thomas Aarons of Fishing the DMV. And Jared Mounts. And so just a little highlight part two. I think we're going to be looking at Pennsylvania, Fishing mm -hmm. Racetown Lake, and uh, some Western Maryland bodies of water. So, Chris, appreciate you coming in. Thank you so and, much, uh, sir. Sharing Thank some you guys for having me. Information that a lot of us don't know about. Yeah. So, we'll see you guys next time. See Thanks. ya. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.